Evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip. It's great to see you. Uh, who's enjoying themselves so far? I, I'm really enjoying myself. I, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm excited about the Easter story. I'm excited about these baptisms. And I'm excited that although they are amazing stories, they're done very understated, like it's all normal, but it is amazing. Hope you got the fact that Dave and Jess on that video are married to one another. And uh, you might not know, but Rich, on the other video uh, with Rachel, Rich was actually the best man at their wedding. And uh, when Dave and Jess got married, Dave was so vehemently opposed to anything to do with Christianity that he put his foot down. He said, I am not getting married in a church. And uh, now he's getting baptized in a church. And uh, Rich was actually the best man at the wedding. And so now they're all getting baptized in front of everyone uh, in this church. So here's a lesson to you, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you get baptized or married in a church. Otherwise, probably you'll have to get baptized in front of everyone and your best man too. And uh, it really is going to be quite public. This is an amazing thing to be able to baptize on Easter Sunday, to be able to rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. This is the day that everything changed. We've used that title throughout all of our uh, publicity for Easter. But I want to use that as my theme this evening as we speak. The day that changed everything. The day where everything changed. Let me read a little passage from the Bible, which is from the book of Mark, which we've been studying the last few weeks as part of our Working Class Hero series. Uh, it'll come up on the screen. This is Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the message and the hope of Easter Sunday. Thank you for the day that everything changed. I thank you, Lord, for the stories of lives that we've heard that have changed even in these last few weeks and months and over years. Lord, I want to pray that you would once again be present with us here in this building, that you would speak to every single one of us. Lord, speak to us whether we're here presently or whether we're watching this on the internet, on our iPhones, on a podcast, wherever we may be. I pray, dear God, that you'd reach out to us, that you'd touch us, that you'd speak to us and that you'd reveal the love of Jesus to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever experienced a day that changed everything? How many people here have ever had an experience that you weren't expecting, you weren't looking for, you weren't anticipating it, but somehow it changed everything? And you knew that it changed everything. Anyone had an experience like that? Okay, quite a few of you. We could go around and we could find out all your stories. For me, the day that changed everything happened when I was 26 years old. I was living in Cobham. Cobham's a very nice place to live. It's full of footballers and uh, big fat houses and great big cars. And I went there as a young man. I was young, free, and desperate. I was single. I was all on my own. And uh, I had dreams of meeting the perfect uh, Mrs. Wright and uh, it was, you know, it was kind of on my mind. And I remember moving to Cobham and my friends saying, so tell us, what's it like? I said, what do you mean, what's it like? You know, the girls. I said, well, there's this one girl. She's a bit of a foxy lady. But I'm being really good. And uh, it was true. There was this one girl and I'd seen her. Uh, I remember being introduced to her. She had a friend and she said, oh, you must meet my friend. She's really beautiful. 
And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure your friend is really beautiful. Girls always think their friend is really beautiful and uh, reserve judgment. But I saw her and I thought, fair play. She's beautiful. In fact, it was the kind of girl that you saw and you wanted to get down on your knees and say, nice one, Lord. Well played. Thank you for making a man, by the way. Uh, And uh, she was just this kind of foxy, gorgeous woman. But um, that was it. But a weird thing happened. I didn't really know her. In fact, I was actually trying to be a good boy and not just get a bad reputation for chasing all the girls. But um, we went out just about a couple of weeks after I'd got to Cobham. We went for a walk with her and a flatmate. And I asked her the question. I said, how did you become a Christian? She told me how she became a Christian. And as she told me, this amazing thing happened. Suddenly, like that, I fell in love. I knew that this was the one. And it was like the heavens opened, the the sun poured down a shaft of golden light. And uh, it was just, you know, choral music happening. And it was, it was insane. It was intense. It was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. I remember looking at this girl, trying to take in every single detail of her appearance, looking at her eyes green, and thinking to myself, this is the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. This is really weird. And uh, it, was, it was so weird. Because I, um, I didn't say anything. I played it cool. And uh, I went away, but I tell you, I was just churned up. Now, when people talk about falling in love, you know what they have as the symbol of love, right? The heart. You get these cards with a nice red heart. For me, it wasn't like that. It wasn't, I guess my heart was beating a little bit faster thinking about her, but it was right here in the gut. Do you know what I'm talking about, boys? I'm talking about you can't eat. You've got butterflies in your stomach. You feel kind of all scrunched up. And uh, I was just feeling it right here. Actually, a more honest card that you could have sent me at that point would have had a picture of 40 foot of long intestine with an arrow through it because that was how I was feeling in the gut. And I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was going crazy. I hadn't talked to her. I hadn't talked to anybody. But this went on for about four days. And after these four days, I thought, this this is weird. This is crazy. You know, I am uh, I'm a grown man. I'm 26 years old. I know the ways of the world. And uh, I just thought, Philip, you've got to get a grip. You've got to get your head back in the game. You're just behaving like a little fluffy puppy. Get a grip. And so I went out and I, I started to, this is completely true, I, I went out and I started praying. And I said, God, I don't know what's happening to me. I don't understand what is with all this stuff. This sounds crazy. It sounds Disney. It sounds just too bizarre. And uh, I was new to Cobham, so I didn't know particularly where I was going. I was just wondering. I was aimless. To be honest, I was all churned up. I was kind of confused. I was wondering, and I would just come to a T-junction, and I'd turn one way, or I'd turn the other, and I just followed my nose, and all the time I was in turmoil, and I was praying, and I was saying, God, help me with this, because I'd never had an experience like this. This is very, very odd. But if this is something that you're in, then you need to help me navigate this. And I'm walking, walking, confused, just babbling. And then I, I walk along this road, and cars are going past, but I don't care. I'm just praying to God, and I look up to God. I stopped. I looked up, and I said, God, I'm not going to be super spiritual Christian nerdy about this. I can be practical. I don't need you to just drop her out of the sky in front of me. At that point, the weirdest experience of my life, I looked down from the heavens, and there she was, the girl. She had just driven past me on this random road that I'd found myself on as I was praying about her. She'd driven past me. She stopped the car. She flung open the door of the car. And as I walked up, she said these words. Jump in. Where do you want to go? Let me take you there. And that was the moment that everything changed. Now, what she was saying was, jump in, where do you want to go? Let me take you there. I'll just give you a lift. She was not aware of what's going on. And it's not like we immediately fell into each other's arms and I got down on one knee. In fact, she had no idea. She had no inkling. She was just giving me a lift. She, you know, I was an acquaintance. She'd spotted me. But when I heard her say, jump in, I was thinking, I'd love to jump in to life, marriage, love, adventure, journeys with you.
And when she said, where do you want to go? I was thinking, ah, oh, so many places. <laughs> the things that we could do, the dreams that we could fulfill, the things that we could experience, the adventures that we could have. And when she said, let me take you there, I was thinking, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Everything changed, but nothing changed. I didn't ask her out. She dropped me off at my house. We had a little coffee. She went off. Nothing changed, but everything changed. Just over a year later, we were married, and that whole thing changed. But there was that one moment where a seemingly insignificant thing had such a, a power and a resonance because of how it happened, when it happened, where it happened, the way it happened, that it changed everything. And now I'm still experiencing the... It's Kate, by the way, my wife. It's okay. She's here on the front row. <laughs> And um, still taking me places, still wonderful. We're in the early honeymoon phase, it's only 17 years. But uh, everything changed, although nothing seemed to change. The ripples went out, 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 out. On Easter Sunday, this is a day that everything changed. These women, they go over to the tomb. And at one point, nothing's changed. They're still trembling, they're still confused, they're still afraid. They flee from the tomb. They don't know what's going on. They haven't seen Jesus, and yet everything has changed. It changes for them, it changes for the disciples, it changes for the entire human race. And the ripples of that Easter Sunday morning event are still being felt in the fabric of very uh, reality today. Everything changed. Three things that changed. The first thing that changed is it changed faith. Everyone say together, faith. It changed faith. Suddenly Christianity was born. Now what you need to understand about Christianity is that Christianity is not like other belief systems. It's not like other religions because Christianity is not founded and based on philosophy. It's not based on teaching or a religious system. It's not based on a bunch of rituals and you do this and you're in and you don't do that and you're not in. No, Christianity is based on a historic event. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can take the teachings and in many cases with many religions, all it is is teaching. You can take the, the, the founder out of it and it doesn't change anything. You take Jesus out of Christianity, you've got nothing. You take the resurrection out of Christianity, you've got nothing. And when the, the angel speaks to these women, he gives them a message. And the message changes faith. Because he says, he's risen, he's not here, go and tell the disciples, go and tell Peter. They need to hear this. And that's how the early church spread. They went around from place to place saying, he is risen, he's alive, we are witnesses of the resurrection. We're not just giving you a brand new way of living. We're not just giving you a brand new way of thinking. We're not just giving you some new teaching, some new ideas, some new philosophy, a nice religious package. We are talking about a fundamental shift in the very nature of life itself. A man has risen from the dead. Everything has changed. And their faith was a faith in the resurrection. When I was a student here at Bristol University, uh, we in my, I think my our second year, my third year, I can't remember which, yeah, I guess it's my third year, uh, we did a little thing as a Christian union, we, we called it the great resurrection scandal, we said the resurrection caused a scandal when it happened, and we wanted to cause a bit of a stink in the university and in Bristol as a whole, and we said, listen, we're not debating the resurrection, but we do want to know what you think happened if the resurrection did not happen, we're Christians, we're, we're disciples, we're, we're Easter people, we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That changes everything. You don't believe that, then what do you believe? You can believe anything, that you can believe that Jesus was abducted by space aliens, that Elvis came and died, you know, whatever you want, but tell us what you believe. And it can only have three ridiculous things in it. If you can come up with a theory, an alternative explanation that has three weird and wacky, but only three weird and wacky things in it that are probably never going to happen, then we will give you a thousand pounds. Now, this was in uh, the 80s, when a thousand pounds was a lot of money. You know, you could buy, like, Holland for a thousand pounds. It was a big deal, and we raised all the money ourselves, and uh, we bought in a, an impartial panel. And the judge, the leading judge on the panel was a barrister. In fact, all the panel were barristers, because we were trying to do it, like, legal burden of proof. And uh, the, the, the leading 
barrister on the panel, the, the, the chairman of the, the judges, was an atheist. But he said, listen, we'll, we'll do this fairly. If you can come up with an alternative explanation, what happened to the body? How did Christianity start? How did they go from 500 scared people to, within 250 years, 9 million people across the Roman Empire? 15% of the Roman Empire. Another 50 years and they were 30 million. How did that happen? Why is it that people were willing to give their lives because they claimed to be witnesses of the resurrection? Peter, crucified upside down. Uh, other disciples, boiled in oil, stoned, beheaded. The Romans persecuted the Christians. They threw them to wild beasts. They put them in gladiator uh, gladiatorial combat. Nero, in his madness, took the Christians and he tied them to stakes for his garden parties. He doused them in tar and set them on fire to light his parties. That's where we get the expression Roman candles from. How did this thing start? These people that claimed that Jesus had truly risen from the dead. And finally, we got ourselves a winner. It went over about six weeks. It was big news. It was in the newspapers, on the radio. People were debating. It was controversial. People were becoming Christians. But uh, finally, one guy won, a guy called Mark. He said, my theory is that Jesus never really died. He just, you know, came over a bit funny. But in the tomb, he managed to recover his strength, move the stone, overpower the guard, convince the disciples he'd risen from the dead. And that's the story. And so the judges said, well, move the stone, sure, overpower the guard, we'll give them that as one. Surviving crucifixion, the whole spear through the side, blood and water mixed, yeah, we'll give you that. He could survive, it's ridiculous, but that's just two ridiculous things. And convincing the disciples, yeah, that's three, you've won. And then he stood up and he said, I don't believe this, I am a Christian, and I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. I'm still keeping the money. But people became Christians because the more, the more you look at it, the more you realize that Christianity is based on an event. In fact, the chairman of the judges, the lead barrister himself, six months later, became a Christian, is in the priesthood today. God did something so powerful that faith is suddenly redefined. It's not just a matter of blind stabbing in the dark. Well, I like this religion. That's quite nice. No. Jesus rose from the dead to give us something concrete to base our confidence on. And that's why those early disciples, they could be tied to stakes and set on fire. And they said to the Romans and they said to their persecutors, they said to their oppressors, they said, you can take our lives, but we have become convinced that he is risen. He can raise us from the dead. Now death is no longer the final word. Now the grave has been defeated. Jesus Christ has the keys of hell and Hades. He is the one that can raise us. He is an ultimate authority. So even though you kill us, and even though you persecute us, even though you take away everything that we've got, we have a faith which is stronger because we know that Jesus is alive. Second thing, it changes power. Everyone say, power. <laughs> power, power, power. Power rangers. The message that the angel gives to the women to pass on, go and tell them that he's risen. That message leads to faith. But the thing that the women experience shows them the extent of God's power. As they walk up to the tomb, they want to anoint Jesus' body, because the way in which he's been killed has been so barbaric, so inhumane. They haven't even been able to anoint his body for burial and do all the regulations and rituals that you would do for a loved one before you put them in the tomb forever. And so they've decided, let's do it now, better late than never, on the third day. But they know that there's a Roman guard, and they know that there's a stone rolled in front of the tomb, and they say, who will roll away the stone? You need to understand that in uh, Jewish times in Palestine, the way that they built their graves, their tombs, was that they would put them in the rock. So they would literally hew them out of solid rock. And they would have them usually in the bottom of a depression. 
uh, at the back of a rich man's garden. There'd be a depression, and leading down into that kind of uh, depression in the garden, that was the, 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 the tomb. And they would seal the tomb with a large stone. So you've got an entrance around about four foot high so that you just bend in to get into the tomb. And the stone is kept at the top of the incline. And then what would they, they would do is they would roll the stone gently. On average, it would take around 20 men to roll the stone down. You're talking about something that weighs around about two tons. And these three women are saying to themselves, we want to do right by Jesus, but how on earth can we move the stone? Never mind about the Roman guard that is uh, guarding that. Maybe they'll have mercy. Maybe they'll roll the stone if they get some extra volunteers. You know, Roman guard, 16 people, we'll chip in. We'll, we'll do our best. How are we going to do this? And they get that. The Bible says, like me wandering down through the rows of Cobham with my head to the heavens and then looking down and seeing the very answer. These women were doing the opposite thing. They were looking down saying, how are we going to move the stone? They look up and then they see the stone's been moved. It's been rolled away. It's as if Jesus has come out of the tomb and kicked the stone into touch. It's come out like a cork kind of a champagne bottle. It is a thrust. The Greek gives a sense of being a long way away. The stone's moved. The power of God. Power makes all the difference in your life. When I moved into uh, my house here in, in Bristol, uh, part of my adventure with Kate, uh, we came in and I was disappointed in our house. I was disappointed because it was a new house, new potential, another chance to get this right, disappointed again. We had a shower, and I was hoping that the shower would be better than the last shower I'd had, and the shower before that, because English showers are rubbish. You know that, don't you? English showers, if you've, has anyone been to America and had an American shower? Okay, you know those showers are powerful. They come down with force. They have, a, I mean, you, they're like industrial machines. In America, this is true, when there's a fire, they call for the fire brigade, and the fireman goes up a ladder with his shower. They are that powerful. In England, our showers are disappointing. They are weak, they are effete, and they lack any kind of vigor. Also difficult to control, either cold or hot, too hot. You have to have the, the skills of a safe cracker to get it right. And we go into this new house, and I'm thinking, hopefully this will be a nice shower experience. Go into the shower, it's rubbish. Same disappointing, damp experience. But, you know, lots of other nice things about the house. Um, the roofs are really big. The ceilings are great. Yeah, hey, Bristol. Uh, but we went in, and uh, about, about 10 days after we'd moved in, I was actually in the shower just trying to deal with the disappointment. Kate was outside, and uh, she shouted in. She said, Hun, I've, uh, I found a switch. Have you noticed this switch? Down by the carpet outside the... Um, Outside the bathroom. And I said, no, no, I haven't. What's it connected to? It's not connected to anything. I said, well, well, go for it. Try it. She flicks the switch. Suddenly, there's this enormous whirring sound, like great machinery spinning into motion. And this shower that I'm in suddenly goes totally insane. The water jets out of it like it's the end of the world. And I'm thrown against the back of the bathroom, water pinging off my chest and knocking little ornaments out of the cabinet. And uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, I think I lost about two pounds in weight in two minutes. It was and, but I'm telling you, it was good. It was like everything I ever dreamed of. This was the moment. It turns out that the people before us had installed a kind of Heath Robinson-style power shower and put it in the most inconvenient place possible so only someone outside of the bath can turn it on for you. But I tell you, my friends, you get into that shower and you're not going to come out until you are well and truly satisfied. 20 minutes later, I came out. The door opens and I emerged roiling clouds of steam about me. And Kate was there, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and we both fell about laughing. Because that power changed everything. Shower didn't change. Bathroom didn't change. Water didn't change. But the power, that changed everything. When Jesus rose from the dead, a power is unleashed into our world, into our experience. 
And these early disciples were able to have their lives changed. Why? Because of power. Because God flicks a switch. Let me show you this verse from Ephesians chapter 1. It says this. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power. Everyone say power. power. For us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And Paul says this, he says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now available to us to change us. Do you have situations in your life that have no means of being resolved? Do you have things that you encounter that you just can't overcome? The Bible says that with the power of the resurrection, the power that thrust out that stone, that power is now available to God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, available to us. And that's why Dave is able to stand in front of you on the video screen and say, if you'd have told me that I would be doing this a couple of years ago, I would have said that you're being ridiculous. I love that bit. But it's power. He says, even I can't believe it. Even I am amazed. I can't see. But it's the power of God. I remember when I used to, uh, when I was younger, I had a real issue with swearing. I was addicted. It was a habitual thing. My, my language was just really colorful. And uh, I remember reading in the Bible one day about not letting bad language come out of your lips and praying and saying, God, man, I, 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 it's just who I am. It, it's too big. It, it, I've done it for too long. But can you help me? Power. Literally overnight, my language changed and never swore again. Until I got a teenage daughter. But that's a different story for a different time. No, I'm just joking. But the power of God can change us. And in a moment, we're going to see these guys baptized. And what they're saying is, Jesus, we want to experience in a greater measure your power. Did you know that the power of God is available to you? You can pray, you can cry out to God on a daily basis for his power. God, would you flip the switch? God, would you make the difference? The shower doesn't change. The water doesn't change. The power changes. And your life, you'll look the same. You'll be the same person. You're still in the same job. You've still got the same difficult relationships. You've still got the same struggles in your marriage. You've still got the same issues with your friends or with your kids. You've still got the same things that you've got to deal with, but suddenly there's power. There's a difference. This is not just about following some rules. This is not just about finding some teaching. It's about experiencing the power of God. And if you're here tonight and you don't know that power, then I want to pray that actually Jesus reveals himself to you and that you reach out to him and ask him for the power of his Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And then finally, it changes God us. Everyone say, God. I love it when the angel says to the women, he says, go and tell the disciples he is risen and you will see him, just as he told you. This is the message, you'll see him. My whole experience of who God is is now fundamentally changed because Jesus has come and lived and died and risen from the dead. He lays claim to divinity. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that God is no longer the vast cosmic being from whom I cower in terror. He's still powerful, but God became a human being, Jesus Christ. And now I can experience God in a much more intimate way. Do you know when Jesus saw the disciples, he said, listen, you can see me, you can feel me. Here I am in a resurrection body. I can eat breakfast with you. I can break bread with you. I can drink the cup with you. He said to Thomas, who had doubted, and you know, who wouldn't? He said, Thomas, look, I'm no ghost. You can touch me. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bone like you see that I have. And Thomas got down on his knees and he said, my Lord, my God, suddenly God is a human man. Adam the second, humanity 2.0. 
a future for us, a promise of a brand new Eden, paradise regained. Jesus Christ is God to the glory of God the Father. He beats death. He beats hell. He beats time. He beats space. And now I have a God that I can relate to. A powerful creator is an awe-inspiring thing. But a God who became flesh, who became a man, who lived a perfect life, who lived the ideal human life. A God who becomes a man that spreads his arms out on a cross and dies for me. And then rises from the dead. That's a God I can worship. That's a God I can trust. That's a God I can give my life to. That's the God that, that I can Go all out for, without any holding back. I don't have to just go through the motions and try to keep the man upstairs happy. I can wholeheartedly live for him. In fact, those three things are just a part of what Easter is about. It gives us that message, go and tell. It gives us a, a, a new faith. It changes faith. And, and the, the power that I experience, power is changed. The way I do life is changed. Problems that I used to have, addictions that I used to have, issues and, and, and challenges. Now there is a brand new power with which to deal with these things. A brand new power to be me. There's faith, there's power, but my relationship with God, I can know him, I can speak to him. He understands, he knows what it's like. He identifies with me. Faith, power, God. In fact, Easter people, about those three things. I have faith in the power of God. That's what Easter does for us. Let's say that sentence together. I have faith in the power of God. One more time. I have faith in the power of God. That's what Easter means. It means that we can have a good, solid, strong foundation for our faith in God's power, which changes everything, is insurpassable power. For a God that we can know and love. And in a moment, I'd like us to pray a prayer. We've got a little Easter prayer for us all to pray together. And then we're going to see these guys being baptized. But you know, some of you, you might be feeling right now, whether you've been a Christian for a long while, whether you've been brought in as by a friend, or whether you're just kind of checking things out. You're, you're just hovering around the margins. But you might feel like I felt when I was wandering the streets in Cobham. Actually, there's a part of you that feels full of questions, a part of you that feels in turmoil, a part of you that has all these different things and you, you don't really know what to do and you're, 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 you're crying out to God just like I was, something churning me up and I didn't know and I had all these things and all these issues. But it's almost like Jesus on this Easter Sunday suddenly appears before you he opens a door of possibility for you. He says, jump in. Where do you want to go? Let me take you there. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. Faith in a resurrection act that changed history. An experience of the power of God that allows me to be everything I was supposed to be. And an experience of a relationship with God, like Rich said in his testimony, not just a bunch of rules and regulations, but Jesus himself, risen from the dead, my God, my King, my everything. I've got a prayer for us to pray right now, and it might be a prayer of rededication for many of us, but for some of you, you've maybe never prayed a prayer like this before, but it's simply a prayer expressing our faith in the power of God. It's going to come up on the screen. We'll pray this together, and then we will uh, baptize these guys. Also, just to let you know that when our formal part of the service is over, we do have a bunch of these discovery packs, particularly for you if you're finding your way back to faith, like Jess has been doing over these last few weeks, or if you are brand new to it, like Dave has been new to it these last few weeks. And this pack has just got a few things in to help you navigate that journey and take the next steps successfully. So let's pray this prayer together. You can follow it on the screen. And let's pray it out loud. You don't have to do this, but I'd just like to invite you as an Easter prayer, a prayer of dedication and commitment to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God of the resurrection, 
I come before you today and offer my prayer to you. You know my wanderings, my questions, my confusion. I dare to believe that you, Jesus, love me, that you came for me, died for me, and rose again. I want to know your incomparably great power in my life to make me the person you created me to be. I ask you to forgive me for my sin, for shutting you out, for living apart from you. I give my life over to you this Easter day. I put my faith in the power of God. Please come into my life and fill me with your spirit. Help me live for you every day from this moment on. I want to jump in. Take me where I need to go, where you want to take me. I pray all this in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.